Hello again. This week, I'll bring this history of the Old Testament to an end. Last week, we left the Jewish people in Babylon, having been taken into exile in Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar. The prophet Jeremiah had foretold that the exile of the Jews in Babylon would last 70 years. By this time, the Persians had taken over Babylon and Persian kings seemed much more concerned about the well-being and especially the religion of their subjects than Nebuchadnezzar and his successors had. We read, the Lord moved the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, to build the temple at Jerusalem, which Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed. It was just about 70 years since the Jewish people had been taken into captivity, and this Persian regime had decided that the Jewish people should return to their homeland. Two men in particular were involved in their return, Ezra and Nehemiah, who have two books in their name in the Bible. Both were officials in Babylon. Ezra was a priest and a scribe and probably an administrator of Jewish affairs under King Cyrus. And Nehemiah was a cup bearer to King Artaxerxes. King Cyrus began it all by sending Ezra back to Jerusalem with the mission of first rebuilding the temple and secondly of reinstating the Jewish law for the people. He sent silver and gold and all sorts of gifts as well as all the valuables Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple. A large number of exiles went with Ezra the heads of families, priests and Levites, everyone the, the account reads whose heart God had moved to go up with Ezra to rebuild the house of the Lord in Jerusalem. Ezra numbers them at over 40,000 people. The mind boggles at the practicalities of this, though it's hardly mentioned in the Bible. Jerusalem was about 500 miles from Babylon, and since the river Euphrates was between them, the journey there was actually much longer than 500 miles, and it must have been highly dangerous with all those valuables. The temple took a long time to build as people were settling into Jerusalem and the neighbouring hometowns and building their own houses. But they began by building the altar of God on which to perform sacrifices and then went on to other sections. Now they were able to worship God with their old rituals and to celebrate the feasts. As they completed each section of the temple, they had great times of praise and thanksgiving with trumpets and cymbals and singing. But there was serious opposition to this building, mainly from foreigners who had their own gods, but also took up the worship of the Lord. I suppose actually they were a bit fed up with all these exiles returning and taking over, and probably jealous since they hadn't done anything about building the temple or the walls of the city. These people did everything they could to intimidate the builders and frustrate their plans. They even wrote a letter to King Artaxerxes in Babylon asking him to stop the building in Jerusalem, for they said Jerusalem was a troublesome, rebellious city which is why it was destroyed in the first place. This was partly true, of course, for Jerusalem had rebelled against the Assyrians when they attacked, and then again against the Babylonians. But these powers were invading and taking over. Artaxerxes ordered the building to stop, 
and the work of the house of the Lord came to a standstill until Darius became king several years later. Meanwhile, back in Babylon, we have Nehemiah, one of the Jewish exiles who had the pri privileged position of cupbearer in the king's court. It was the task of the cupbearer to taste the king's wine to make sure it wasn't poisoned, which seems rather a risky job, but apparently Nehemiah enjoyed a close relationship with the king who trusted him completely. This king, Artaxerxes, was a different king to the one who'd stopped the building in Jerusalem. One day, Nehemiah met one of the men who'd recently come from Judah, and he asked him about how things were in Jerusalem and what the city was like now. And he heard how the exiles who'd returned were facing great opposition as they tried to rebuild the city and temple, and how defenceless the city was with broken walls. Nehemiah wept when he heard these things, and prayed to God that he would gather all his exiled people together and bring them back to their own land as he had promised. And that night, as he served the king's wine, he still felt very depressed about Jerusalem and could not be his usual smiling self when dealing with the wine. And the king noticed that Nehemiah looked downhearted as it was so unusual for him and asked him why. And Nehemiah burst out, I've just heard that the city where I was brought up lies in ruins. The king looked at him and asked, what is it you want? Nehemiah replied, let me go to Jerusalem so that I can rebuild it. The king and the queen asked how long it would take him and when he would be back. Then they gave him permission to go. So Nehemiah left Babylon and returned to his native land. After inspecting the damage, he gathered some officials together and said, Come, let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. The king has sent me to do this, and God has been very gracious to me. So they started the task. But they too soon came across fierce opposition, mostly from someone called Sanballat, who was the governor of Samaria, and Tobiah, who was probably governor of Transjordan under the Persians. They felt threatened by the arrival of Nehemiah, and when Nehemiah suggested rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem, they ridiculed the idea. But Nehemiah and his men carried on until the gates were repaired and the walls reached half their height. At this point, Sambalat and Tobiah plotted to kill them. But Nehemiah had confidence that the Lord would guarantee them success. However, we read, now only half the men worked on the walls while the others stood by to defend them. And the workmen had their materials in one hand and a sword in the other. Nehemiah was appointed governor over Judah and he continued to work tirelessly never claiming the privileges or wealth of previous governors. He also cared for the poor and established justice and fair treatment for all. And although his enemies were persistent in trying to thwart his work, he was equally persistent in resisting them. Finally, after 52 days of non-stop work, the wall was completed and Sambalat and Tobias withdrew for the time being. Now Nehemiah conferred with Ezra, and they decided it was the right time to instill the laws and commandments of Moses into the people. Nehemiah assembled all of them in the city centre, and got Ezra to bring out the book of the law of Moses, 
he read it aloud from daybreak to noon, and everyone listened attentively. And they praised God, and the priests explained the scriptures to the people so that they understood it. And we read, the people wept because they understood. Nehemiah told them not to weep, for he said that lovely phrase, the joy of the Lord is your strength. So they celebrated with great joy because they felt they understood the word of the Lord at last. Later in the month, they gathered together again and confessed their sins before the Lord, how they'd not obeyed him, nor had they listened to the warnings of the prophets. And they all swore to follow the law of God and to obey his commandments. And we read, their joy was very great as they worshipped the Lord and celebrated. It would be great if we could leave it there. The long period of exile was over. The people had returned to their homeland, built up the temple and city and settled in their own homes again. And best of all, they'd vowed to live by God's law and were joyful in their worship. God's people were restored and could start again. But the powers around the Middle East would not leave Israel and Judah alone to live as God's people. All was well as long as the Persians were in charge. But then Alexander the Great invaded, defeated the Persian army, and took over the country. After he had died, the Greek rulers tried to eradicate the Jewish religion and greatly oppress the Jews. Then the Romans took over and oppressed the Jews politically, though they were allowed to practice their religion as long as they did not cause trouble. Which brings us to the New Testament, to the life of Jesus at which point I'll bring these talks to an end. Well, my aim over the past few weeks has been to present the main characters of the Old Testament, who most of us have heard of, and to place them within the context of the Old Testament, and to place them within the context of the Old Testament. So stories like David and Goliath and Daniel in the lion's den are not isolated stories, but part of a whole. If you survived the whole series, I hope you'll have a clearer understanding of the Old Testament and the history of God's first chosen people. So let's pray. The joy of the Lord is my strength. We give thanks for the example of those Jewish people worshipping you with such joy. Help us not to be too serious in our worship, not to be afraid of praising you with exuberance and joy. And as Ezra and Nehemiah had to face such opposition in their work for you, let us bear in mind that we will usually face some opposition when we're doing something worthwhile. But help us to persevere with persistence like they did and not give up easily. And when things are hard and it goes on for a long time, Help us to be patient and not give up hope in you. Thank you for the examples of Ezra and Nehemiah. Lord, be with us in our Bible study and help us to understand and explain to others the meaning of the scriptures, your purposes for your people and your love for us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.